Okay, hello everybody. Thank you very much for your patience and for you know putting up with waiting for me today. I appreciate that. Um, busy day. Um, you snatch some food when you can, so thanks very much for that. Um, and thanks again for coming along. Um, this so last, as I said before, last week um, we were looking at products and price books. We looked at formulae. It was quite a heavy week last week, so uh, I thought, given the fact that we had done so much um, work on products and price books, and because I, I struggled to, to snatch a few minutes to put together a, um, an assignment, I'll be honest, throw my hands up. Um, you know, last week we had some time off for, um, for homework. But um, don't worry, this week I won't be setting you double homework. Uh, this week I will uh, be setting you um, a scenario for you to build out amongst yourselves. Um, and today, what I would like us to do is to focus on a couple of other things, um, which I think you might actually really enjoy. One is that we need to actually finish off our validation rules, uh, finish off our formulas, roll ups, and validations badge, um, so we can go ahead and do that. And guess what? Today is the 4th of May, which means that if you complete a trailhead badge today, you will get an extra badge that's that says, May the 4th be with you. Uh, <laughs> so enjoy sometimes you get these quirky little things thrown in as well so uh today is your star wars badge day um <laughs> jerry's dressed for the part i rebel i rebel i rebel no you don't need to sign up for it any badges you get today you'll automatically also get the may the fourth be with you badge so um <clears throat> so i hope you will enjoy that shall we there's a couple a couple of things that we haven't done yet we have not looked at record types yet and we haven't looked at validations and so and there's a couple of things around service cloud like on wednesday i'm planning to take you through service cloud and some of the concepts around cases and entitlements and things like that um so what i thought we'd do today let's let's go through validations let's go through record types i'm not sure if there's i've, I've gone and looked for trailhead badges um that specifically deal with record types and i've seen them kind of dotted around um you know for different things so perhaps yeah perhaps we can look at a project for that that we can do together so shall, without further ado i'm going to share my screen um and let's finish off this badge that we started last week around formulas and validation rules. So we should see the first two sections are now complete. So we had use formula fields and implement roll up summary fields. Um, quick pop quiz. When you create a roll up summary field, what's the type of relationship between the objects that you must have in place? sorry yeah pop quiz just threw it at you um yeah so what's the type of relationship that you must have in um between two objects in order to implement a roll-up summary field <laughs> yes that's correct so it is a master detail yes um and where do you create on which object out of those out of that um relationship would you create your roll-up summary okay so that's not correct you wouldn't put your roll-up summary on the child you would create your relationship on the child but your roll-up summary does go on the parent well done samira that's correct um what else can i throw at you oh uh, true or false you can use comments in a formula field true yes you can jeremy says does the data type need to be a specific data type nurse that number versus multiple type uh data type is master detail for the roll up yeah so so good question jeremy can anyone remember the types uh the four types of mathematical summary that you can create for a master detail without opening up your playground and having a look hmm. 
So Manish got it right. Count, sum, max, and min. There is no average, that's right. Samira, average is on reports, so I can see why you put that there completely. Okay, excellent. Let's have a look at validation rules. So if you all could open up Trailhead, go to our old favorite, the formulas and validations and click on create validation rules. I'll put this, I'll put the link in the chat just to make it easier for you. And I'll catch you there. Assuming you can all see my screen, right? Marvellous. Okay. Validation rules. So I'm going to read this out and then I'm going to translate it. So introduction to validation rules. Validation rules verify that data entered by users in records meet the standards you specify before they can save it. Basically, what that means, and validation rules can be a bit of a baptism, bat, baptism of fire. Um, I learned how to, as soon as, but as soon as I understood exactly what a, a validation rule was doing, that helped me to create more validation rules in the future. So a validation rule can be created for objects, fields, campaign members, or case milestones. We haven't looked at case milestones, that's service cloud. Now, a validation, can anyone explain what is the difference? Why would you use a validation rule versus creating a mandatory field? Satara says so you can report on the data. Any others? Make sure it's a number so you protect your data. Uh, check something or it's a valid email format consistency you can proceed or not with the data validation will require some sort of compliance but could still be null kind of there's quite a variety of answers there but i think then the closer so so in response to you know if you're making sure that it's a number use it in your experience of salesforce so far how would you make sure that a field contains a number That's correct. So you would use the data type. That's correct. So in terms of, so let me explain. So, so if you wanted to make a field mandatory, um, but mandatory, uh, mandatory for everybody, what are the pos two possible ways you could do that without using a validation rule? Yeah. So you can, you can check, required samir is quite right you can do it at field level or at page layout level correct you can make a field required using page layouts using the spanner that shows up next to the field or you can do it at the when you create the field you can actually make it required as well now obviously think about this in terms of levels if you need if you make a field required at the field level it's going to be required by absolutely everybody around the whole system that also means it's going to be required for any integrations that take place. So if you have a um, if you have data coming into Salesforce from another system, then and you have a, a field that is required at field level, which is perfectly valid, um, you could require the, the incoming message to contain that data so it can be mapped to that required field. Correct. When you do it at page layout level, you are effectively saying that any user profile okay. that this page layout has been assigned to, that's when it will be required. I have an idea, but no. Okay, so validation rules is when things is when you need to make data when you need to make fields required under very specific circumstances, and the use cases for that could include looking at the profile of the user who is editing the record looking at other fields so you could actually make it um a field 
you could actually make a field, uh, the data in a field required based on data that exists in another system. For example, if, um, if uh, the opportunity state is proposal or price quote, you need to tick a box that says um, pri uh, proposal attached before you can change the stage. So that would be a that would be a classic um, validation rule use case. Samira so says if a field is required at field level, everyone gets to view it. Correct? Um, correct. Unless you have um, unless there is a dependency um, in terms of field level security. If you make a field required at field level, they have to be able to view it. But you could make it on um, using a profile and you use field level security. You could actually make it invisible. And in that case, it's not required. Remember the story about the seventeen thousand timesheets, and um, how somebody how somebody disappeared a field, and it wasn't getting filled in, and all the costs were wrong, and Muggins here had to sit there for four hours updating all the data, and you know, completely skewing all their accounts. Yes, that's uh, some of the impact, some of the things that can happen. Um, but yes, there is a dependency between them to, between the two. So on with the unit. When we look at creating a validation rule, the first one we're going to create is for an account. So if you wouldn't mind just opening up your um, your Trailhead Playground, I have just uh, flipped down to the bottom and I'm launching my playground. Now, the thing to remember with, with validation rules is the syntax is the same as you would have for a formula field. Um, the difference is that you want is that is understanding what happens when you run that validation rule. So we are going to, first of all, so when you create, when you run your validation rule, what actually happens is your set, the rule says, if this record is created or edited and it meets the criteria of the formula that you put in, then don't allow users to save the record and instead show an error message. And this is my favorite kind of thing, like for admins, you know, and I say this with the highest level of sarcasm, because there are so many times, like, you know, there's a story of, of um, there's, a, there's actually a hashtag on the community called why admins drink. Um, and one of the, fa one, of the fa one of my favorite ones that I ever read was how somebody uh, went up to an admin with a screenshot where they, they'd hit a validation rule. They hadn't put the right amount, they hadn't put the right data in. And the error message was actually written by that admin. And they took a photo, took a screenshot of it and then um, walked it and printed it and walked it over to the admin and said, um, I'm really stuck here. I think I've broken Salesforce. And the, the, the clue was in the error message. The error message told them what to do. But the minute the psychology was that, oh, my God, there's a red message. I, I'm stuck. I broke something. I need to help somebody. And um, one of my one of my friends said to me uh, once that um, when they had that happen over email, um, somebody took a screenshot of the validation rule failing. They just took, they just um, Went went along and, and uh, copied the text in the error message for the validation rule. Emailed it back to them and said, "This is what you need to do." And they wrote back and said, "That's great, thank you." <laughs> Just like, oh my god. Anyway, <laughs> so the validation rule that we're going to create today is uh, focused on um, accounts. Sorry, a couple of questions. So if a fit, so does it mean if you're not assigned that page layout and it's not a field level security, then you wouldn't have to fill out the field? Correct. Yep. So if the if the if the field is missing on the page layout and it's not a field level requirement, then you know you're not going to have to fill it out because it doesn't appear on the. You can't fill something out if it doesn't appear on the page layout. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. So back to this. We're going to go to Object Manager. I hope you're all backstage. And we're going to go to Account. And we're going to go to guess what? Uh, scroll down. It's the last thing because all of the options are shown in alphabetical order. It's the last option on the left called validation rules. And you'll see that you have absolutely nothing here. And that's fine. So the one we're going to create, we're going to go and create a new one. And I just want to talk you through what's on this page, first of all. As with everything in Salesforce, you have to give it a name. Um, validation rules are kind of odd in their naming convention because if I just write, hello, my name is Gemma, and then tab to the next box, Salesforce puts underscores between all the words because it can't accept any spaces in the name. 
Um, but it will do that for you naturally uh, when you tab away from it. Um, as with anything in Salesforce, please put in a description. And actually, I find with, with validation rules, the best way to explain it for me has been prevents the user from saving the record if or when. And that help, that will help you to figure out and rem remember why you created that rule and what it's actually doing. You then have your error condition formula. So what we're saying here is if this happens or that happens or that happens and this happens or not happens, that this doesn't happen and, you know, this begins with that and this, uh, uh, you know, uh, December plus three months or whatever, you know, whatever your, your formula is, then display an error message. And this is this is absolutely key here, this piece where it says this message will appear when the error condition formula is true. And one of the things that, um, that I've seen people do is, you know, there's a couple of sneaky workarounds you can do. If you just want a validation rule to always run no matter what, which you would never want to do, but um, it's a cheeky trick, you can just put the word true. And if you leave it as that, no users will be able to change any account records at all, <laughs> ever, and they won't know why. So I'm not tempting you to do a like a you know your last week in the office kind of job, but um, <laughs> that could be a pretty evil thing. <laughs> you go, I didn't tell you this. True, and then you can put in any any uh, error message you like. Um, you know, you have cheese on your chin for example yes you could yeah april it would make a good april fall um a little bit cheeky uh, you could even put links in here as well so you could even put like you know <laughs> you pretend to hold, pretend it's some kind of ransomware but please don't do that because that's not professional um wow so uh okay so Hopefully, you're all going to understand what the hell I was going on about there. So back to the trailhead badge, what we're going to do is create a rule, which is the account number has to have eight characters. So I'm just going to account number eight characters uh, in the name. That's what the name needs to be, account number eight characters. So this prevents the user from saving the record if when the account number does not have eight characters length. So how would I do this? Uh, I would go through, just like you would with any formula field, uh, <laughs> you, could, you just click insert field and then get your account number field. And remember, like with formulas, you can go through and get data from other, you can create cross-object cross validation rules as well. Uh, so account number, so I've got the field I want, the operator that I'm going to want, and I'm going to check this in a minute, is the len, uh, not the operator, the function, uh, because I want to assess the num the length of um, the data in this field. So I'm just going to go around, hit down here and check my syntax. Okay, so that is looking for a text field. So if you were working with a pick list value, for example, you would have to turn that into text. If you were looking at a number field, uh, like number of employees, you would have to do, uh, you would have to convert your number field into text and you would just do that with uh, learn text number field. Like that. Okay. So for this one, this is just assessing the length of the account number. Remember to close off your parentheses. And then I'm just going to put in that it's not eight. Let's check it. Perfect. No errors found. Now, the one inconsistency here is that in, in formula fields, when you check your syntax and it's all, it's all fine, it goes green, right? It says compilation, you know, success, blah, blah, blah. You're such an amazing person. Um, my validation rule is probably the most British version of this to say, you know, no errors found, just like normal grey. Um, well done, you did your job. So let's check. Yes, yeah, so invalidating. Uh, so let's just check what was Trailhead telling us to do. Ah, Trailhead was telling us to do this in a slightly different way. 
Trailhead was telling us that we can use an exclamation mark and an equals, which also means not equal to. So that's something, that's another approach you can do. Um, like you say, it's all about style and your own style, whatever you want. So let's, um, that will still do the same thing because it's, because your, um, this is basically just saying not, as you can see, yeah, not equal. Okay. But they'll both do this, they should both do the same thing. Personally, I'm a fan of these. Okay. So then, if the um, if the result of this formula is true, so if it is uh, not equal to eight, if the length of the account number is not equal to eight, so even that could even mean if it's blank as well, um, then you can display an error to say you should enter enter an account number with eight characters. Um, something else you, I mean, with this one, this is where my brains get, my brain gets going because at certain stages when you create an account, you're not always going to know what the account number is. So one of the things you can do is you can exclude this formula, uh, this validation rule from running if the record is brand new. So you could still allow people to convert leads and you could still allow people to create an account, um, but you can let them off entering the account number um you know in the first instance because it might be a prospect account and therefore not valid um and you could just have this rule kick in um when the uh account type becomes customer or the next time someone goes to change it so the way i would do that is just go not is new like that but then of course because i've got two lines in there i need to join them together with an and So this is now saying, if the if the account is changed and it is not new and the um, account number is not equal to eight, then display this um, error message. Okay, that's not what Trailhead's asking us to do, but that's how that's frankly how I would be in, how I would be looking at doing that in a real life situation because in real life you don't always know the account number and validation rules can prevent leads being converted just something to bear in mind okay let's uh see what does trailhead want us to say so account number must be eight characters long so i will i shall be compliant in this instance i'm one of those annoying people that gets a recipe and then doesn't follow it just do my own thing and then i wonder why it comes out wrong okie dokie then you can choose where you display the error message. So you could display uh, the error message at the top of the screen. I tend to use that if um, if I'm giving an instruction that involves more than one field. I will tend to use uh, I will tend to display the error at the top of the page. If it's to do with a specific field, then I can actually display the error fit the error message on the account number field itself. So that if I then go and try and save my account record, it shouts at me at the field where I'm supposed to fill in the data. So let's save that and give that a wee well. Okie doke. Back to home, into our accounts. If I then try and change an account and I haven't put a, an account number in, it should proper yell at me. So I'll go to TNR core, details. And okay, my account number is currently blank. Let's see if we can change the type. So I'm going to scroll down, click on prospect, save. It should yell at me. There we go. We hit a snag. <laughs> right, okay. Review the field, account number. So account number must be eight characters long. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Let's see what happens. It should continue to yell at me. Yeah. This is how you test. Let's see if I make if I go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven and save. It should still yell at me. Yep, that's correct. That's step two of the test. It's doing the right thing. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight characters. Save it. It should save. And that's passed the test. That's doing what it should do. Everybody clear on that so far? Any questions at all?
Cool, huh? So you can make all kinds of messages appear. Please be sensible. Um, right, so Salesforce gives us a little view on you know, what should be happening when this happens. Um, so here are some more examples that we can work through. So if you want to make an account number num numeric, um, that's interesting. Ah, okay. So this form, what this formula is doing, and I'm going to copy it and create a new one. Um, you can have multiple validation rules running on the same field. Um, what will happen is you just get two error messages. One of the things I also like to do is to clone and just make changes. So if I want to, um, if I, and that's usually if I'm feeling lazy and um, I just want to change the odd word instead of writing out the whole description or the whole name or there's already some fields in there that I want to pull through and I just can't be bothered to go into the menus and have a look. Uh, so this one is account number is not numeric. Let's have a go at making that. Account number is not numeric. So I cloned my old one. I'm creating a new one. Um, this will prevent a user from saving the record if and when the account number is not numeric. So if it's not numeric, what we have to do, okay, so this, can anyone explain in, in a bit more detail like what this formula is saying? Correct, yeah, so check that there's something in it. So we're checking that the field actually has an account number. And it has to be a number, yeah. So if it is not a number and it is not blank, what's gonna happen? Okay, it doesn't accept it. Yeah, so it will show an error, an error of your own devising. Let's check the syntax, just make sure, because you never can be too careful. And you can just change this to say the account number must be numeric. So I'm going to save that and let's go and test it again. Let me show you how some really effective ways to test. So going back to my account, if I edit my account number and change it to six, six seven six. That should save because it's gone back because it's got eight characters. Let's say I change the last um, number to be a, a letter V. It should shout at me. Yeah, account number must be numeric. What happens if I then add in a couple of others, other characters? I should then get two. So Yes, so now you get two errors. You get the account number must be eight characters long. And you also get the account number must be numeric. So you see how that's two validation rules that are firing off there. And sometimes you might choose to kind of bake those in uh, into one rule if you want to. Um, but I would think think about um, the propensity for that to change in the future. If you think that you know numbers are numeric now but may not be in the future, then you probably want to separate out those two um, rules. <coughs> OK, so you can be as fussy or as not fussy as you like with your system. Word of warning, validation rules can be um, a huge issue when it comes to user adoption. I have logged it, as can the number of fields. And I have logged into many an org, which is you, you open up the account page and it's just scroll, 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 like how many fields, most of them being required lots of validation rules. Um, personally, I'm not a patient person, so if I'm working on a form, I'm if I'm filling in a web form, um, I often get fed up if, if, if there's too much stuff that I have to fill in um, or if it gets fussy over certain things. Earlier, I was filling out an address field. Every single part of the address was required, including the county. And um, from my perspective, that got me worried because in my particular, in my postal address, I live in a village outside a town. So outside a town and the, I live in the county town. 
So when people when people see the word Bedford, they know it's Bedfordshire um, in the UK. Um, it's when and, and actually that's that's how many banks um, have set have it set up as well. So when I have to if I have to fill in beds um, or Bedfordshire as well as the rest of my um, address, if I'm working if I'm filling out a form for like a shopping site, I then get concerned because I know that data is going to fly from the shopping site over to my bank and it will do some checks there. And if the two addresses don't match exactly then that can actually cause credit card payments to fail and cause a lot of problems when I'm doing online shopping or when I'm trying to transfer money to people etc so just just things to bear in mind yeah the experience is really key here as well so uh, some some counties some towns don't have counties like London I wouldn't you know London I wouldn't put a county in Manchester I wouldn't put a county in but I've seen many a website where they force you to <coughs> right so next one date must be in the current year so this one looks at whether a, a custom date field contains a date that is in the current year so um you know that's a validation rule that you can put in and we have a number range validation as well so if you want to see that and there are different approaches for this you can you can kind of say um, if if a range, if something is if a number field is between this field and that field, you can kind of do an if the temptation is to do an if statement. But actually, what I like about this formula is it's it's actually flipping that on its head and it's saying, okay, if I take the minimum away from the maximum, what's left? And actually, is that um, is that going to be great? You know, make sure it's not greater than twenty k. You can do that with days as well. Some other things you can do, you can use um, you can use um, validation rules to ensure that you put the right website extensions. Um, how many times have you filled out a form online when, where it's looking for a URL and then it yells at you because you haven't started with HTTP? That annoys me. Um, but you know that's that's a validation rule that somebody's written, and you. And um, and then things like your your billing country as well. So if you wanted to enforce how a billing country is populated and making sure it's consistent throughout, you could actually enforce a validation rule that says, you know, your country has to be an ISO two letter code instead of a um, instead of a, a you know because there are many variations. I've seen GB, I've seen UK, I've seen United Kingdom, of Great Britain, and Northern Ireland. I've seen England. I've seen, you know. This helps you to put some consistency in, and it, it's these these kind of rules are more important for two things. One is your your integration. Second is things like marketing. If you were going to extract um, a list of potential prospects, leads, contacts uh, based upon a consistent region, then having a validation rule really helps in that instance. Um, one thing I do know that they have implemented at Salesforce is the notion of state and country pick lists, which can help with that as well. It's a feature you can switch on and it turns um, states and countries into, um, into drop down pick lists. Um, there are some limitations on the countries that, you, that are included in the scope of that um, naturally, but you can add your own states and countries to that, to that as well. Um, just a bit of an arduous job, but you can get around it easily enough. So let's let's play with this one uh, and do this exercise together. As I've waffled on for well, nearly fifty minutes um, on this, and I know you all want to get your badge. So let's um, create a validation rule to check that the contact is in the zip code of its account. So you're basically checking, this is a cross object validation rule, and you're checking that the contact's mailing zip code matches the account's billing zip code. S oh no, shipping postcode. Okay, fine, play with me then. So we are going to create our validation rule on the, which object? That's correct. We're going to do it on the contact. We want the contact record to be. We want the contact record to match what's on the shop on the shipping on the shipping address for the account, and the account is the parent of the contact. So bear in mind, if you had uh, an, an an object underneath that was related to the contact, and you wanted to validate based upon 
uh, the data that's on another object, then you would need to use a VLOOKUP function. And it's the only place in Salesforce where you can create a VLOOKUP function is on a validation role. So let's go to our contact record. I'm going to go to validation rules, which is at the bottom. And we're going to create a new validation rule. Now, make sure that your namings conventions are the same as what you have is as what is required. So, uh, add a validation rule, block the saving of a new account that and has mainly post call code different from the okay, it doesn't say what we should name. Ah, oh, there we go. Contact must be in account zip code. Okay, so I'm going to copy that and paste it. Please make sure it matches exactly because of the checking. So Kat says, but we need to make a shipping address field. Um, well, the shipping address field is actually a standard field that is already on the, on the account record. So fortunately, we don't have to do that. So again, putting in our description. So it prevents the user from saving the record if the mailing oh, mailing zip code does not match the account shipping remember there are two addresses on the account zip code So this is cross object. So we've got to go and get the two. First of all, my, I prefer to do, the, do it this way. I like to go and get my fields first and then figure out what to do with it afterwards. So insert field. The first field we want is on the account. So we go through to our account record. And then we are going to go and find our shipping code. Now, a little trick, hit the word S. It'll take you right there. Hit the letter S on your keyboard. It will take you right there. Um, now, remember, you've got shipping address, which is an amalgamation of all the data that is in the fields for the shipping country, uh, ship, uh, city, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So please don't pick that one. What we want is the split out um, version. So we want the, the zip and postal code, which has been separated out from the address. So we just click shipping zip postal code and then hit insert. And as you can see, you can tell it's cross object because it starts prefixed with the name of the object and a, and a full stop, sorry, a period, and then shipping postal code. The next field I wanna go and get is the mailing zip code. So that is on the contact record. So I'm just going to click in one field here and then hit the letter M to take me right down to where I need to be. And I'm going to find the uh, mailing zip postal code. So for this, it's just if this is just going to kick off when the two don't match, all I really need to do here is this and check my sy my syntax. Yes. So all I've said here is that if this, so uh, this is not equal to that because if the result of this is true, if it is really isn't equal to that, then the error message will kick off. Let me check. Okay, okay. So the validation rule should only apply to contact records with an associated account. The plot thickens. So contact records with no associated parent account can be added with any mailing postal code value. Hint you can use is blank for this check. So we need to know whether this, this contact actually is related to an account. So the first, the, the one thing that we do need to do is go and get this account ID, which is the, and, and I'm not going to, the reason I'm not, I'm not going to click here, I mean, I could click into there if I wanted to, but it's just a waste of character space. Um, I actually want to check if there is an account ID against this contact just by looking at, pardon me, what's in this um, account ID field, because if that's blank, then there's no account. I could do it that way. But it's just a longer way of doing it. So I'm going to click insert. So I've got the field that I want, the extra field I want. So um, to check if this is blank, I'm going to put in the is blank um, op, uh, function here. 
And all this is doing is just saying, is this blank? And at the moment, um, you know, bearing in mind that we want to know if this expression is true. So at the moment, is blank, um, if the account ID is blank and that is not equal to that, then um, then it's going gonna, it's gonna to show an error, which is not what we want. Because what we want to do is allow any postal code, any zip code to come through um, for orphan contacts. So in order to figure this out, what we actually had to do is put a not in there. So not is blank account ID. You could just get yourself into the habit of if you open up a, a bracket or a parenthesis, close it at the same time so you know where you are. So this is going to fail. Let's have a look. It's going to fail because it's saying, hang on a minute, you've got an extra thing here. And that's because you haven't actually joined these statements and ar these arguments together to into something logical. So what I'm going to do here is add an AND statement, tie it all together. And then I'm going to put a comma in between. Question from Jeremy. Oh, I just clicked the wrong button. Apologies. Question, is there, is there no need to explicitly reference the contact mailing postal code because the rule is created on the contact record? Yes, contact is implied and assumed because you're already on the contact record. That's correct. The prefix of the object is when it's cross object. So what this, so what this comma is doing now is it's saying it's actually closing off one argument. So this argument is that the account ID is not blank. So there's something in the account ID. So there it is related to an account. And, okay, so, and, and then it goes to the second argument, which is the postal code is equal, is not equal to the mailing postal code. If I get rid of that, if I get rid of that comma, it's just gonna, it's gonna say there's an extra parenthesis. Or a missing parenthesis, yeah, because it's looking for um, the argument to be closed off. And actually, it's nothing to do with parenthesis, it's to do with the comma. So this is now saying return an error if the or whenever the account ID is populated and the postcode and the mailing postcode don't don't max don't match. Now, this is just my way of doing it. Lots of people have other different ways. Um, so the error that we have to show, does it tell us what error it should have? No? Okay, I'm just going to put one in. Your dreaming mate. And I'm going to show the error on the mailing postal code yes on the account sorry one more question do you only need one and regardless of the number of conditions um yes for this particular group of arguments yes um where i mean another way you could cut this is to say if uh, not is blank account ID. So if the account, so yeah, th yeah, there's another way you could do this. So you could say if um, not is blank account ID and that is not equal to that, then true, else false. Because the true bit is when you're saying, if it's true, then display the error. If not, it's not true. They should both do the same thing. I'm going to test that. I'm going to test that by commenting out my first formula. Boom, there you go. 
So if that is not blank and the postal code is not equal to that postal code, then return true, else return false. And if it returns true, it will just return your error message. So style is, you know, there's, there's a few ways you can do this stuff. And you will become more familiar with how your, um, your formulas are built out as you start to build more formulas. So let's save. Okay, who's ready to check their challenge? Because what I think the checking mechanism is going to do, it's going to run a script inside the trailhead org, and it's going to attempt to um, create an account, uh, create a contact against an account. Um, actually, probably not against an account, actually. Um, Actually, it probably would do both. If I was creating that script, I would have it do both. I would have it create an account um, and then create a contact and then have the mailing address, the mailing, um, the mailing uh, postal codes match. Then I would try it without the matching. And then I would actually take away the account ID and then try it and then do the same thing. So that's what I think your script, the script is going to do. So let's see if I'm right. You got confetti, woohoo! Okay, if you got confetti and it worked, go and check in your trailhead um, badges. So check on your profile. You didn't get the fun badge. Well, it might take a minute to come through. I got confetti too. Let's see. Did I get it? Where's my badges? Show more. Hmm. Okay. Everyone comfortable with that one? Yep, amazing. Well, well done, everybody. You have completed the formulas and validations badge. I know it took us a few um, sessions, but um, we've been through it in quite a lot of detail. So hopefully you should all now be absolute pros, you know, and uh, off you go. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, any questions about this? Um... <laughs> no fun badge. I guess my midi chlorian levels are too low. Is that a Star Wars joke? Because for me, I I don't really do it. But I'll let you guys all chuckle. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, anyone struggling with that one? Okay, cool. Right. Well, well done, everybody. You have completed that one. So I think I'm going to let you guys choose. Would you what would everybody like to do? Um, would everybody like to work? Should we work? Would everybody like to work through a project together? Um, on Trailhead, where we get to build an application with um, with a couple of interesting, cool stuff in it. Um, or would you like to move on to, yeah, you all want to do that? Or would you like, the other option is to move on to Service Cloud. Okay, let's go and build an app together. And this one I can do with you, actually. You want to make a thing. Let's go and make a thing. Okay, the badge you want is called, it is a project badge, and I've never done it before, so I'm going to be doing it with you. Okie doke. Right, I need to get a quick sip of water. You guys have a little look at that for a minute and I'll be right back. Thank you. 
<laughs> so excited. <laughs> yeah, me too. Okay, we're going to create a recruiting app. Everybody ready for this one? Amazing. So, um, now I think we started doing this um, in, another, in another world. So what we might have to do, let's just check our objects. We've got, did we have uh, candidates? No. Did we have positions? No. Okay. All right. Let's press on. So the first thing we're going to do is understand what the hell we're building here. Uh, that's a, a good start, huh? So we're going to create a tab for the review object. And I'm going to use this to teach you some, most of these concepts you'll know already now, um, if you've been following along. And I'm going to throw one brand new concept at you while we go. So blah, blah, blah about AW Computing. So AW Computing has got a recruiting app. The HR team uses it as they work to place applicants into open positions. Ling Wu, the vice president of HR, would like her recruiters to have an efficient user interface that helps them match the right candidate with the right job more quickly. Question, have some of you got a positions object because of the homework we were doing? If you have, yeah, if you have, I would suggest you create a new uh, trailhead playground for this one. So let's go to hands-on orgs. If you click on your profile picture. And we are going to, oh, you need to spin up a new one. Okay. Uh, but if you, have, if you have got your old, um, if you've got your previous badge open and you can get back down to the challenge, um, click retake this challenge. I'm just um, kind of improvising here. If you go back to the badge that you were doing a minute ago, so if you've closed it, just look in your history and you should be able to find it. Um, open up the challenge again and scroll to the bottom and then click retake challenge. And then if you click the name of your playground, instead of clicking launch, you click the drop down list, scroll to the bottom, you will have another option to create a trailhead playground. So if you click that, that will start spinning up a brand new trailhead playground for you that you can then use in this new task. So the first thing we have to do is build a data model for the recruiting app. <laughs> OK, let's go ahead and do it. So we're going to create a custom object, first of all. Oh, the plot thickens. Now we have to do a managed package. So once you've got your, your org set up, um, do you know what? We might as well do this together, because if you go off and do this on your own, you're going to come up against these occasions where you have to install a package into your trailhead playground and if you're on your own it's harder to do than you've got than it is if you've got someone with you to kind of walk you through it so um can someone shout when they've got their new org provisioned because sometimes it can take a few minutes just to come through i'm going to check mine hello where are you talking come on then no mama okay so i was using uh resourceful wolf now i'm a brave wolf okay so in order to kick that off something you need to do once you've got your new org and as you can see it hasn't found it yet click launch yeah it's still spinning it up so just take a moment let me talk through the concept. What we're going to have to do. So, um, so there's some things you can. There's a couple of things that you can do with Salesforce um, in, ter in terms of um, building stuff. So you know that we've we've spent time building custom objects, validation rules, fields, profiles, permission sets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Some things, other things that you can do with Salesforce is you can package up the, um, some anything that you kind of build on Salesforce, and actually. This is how many companies make their money. 
Um, they build applications on Salesforce, so they might build an accounting package, which includes a general a set of general ledger accounts, so that's a custom object with fields on it. They, it, might, it might include uh, an invoice with invoice lines. It might include a, um, a purchase order with purchase order lines, and then there might be a bunch of code in it as well. And that's something that developers or, sorry, um, integrated solutions vendors can put together into a package and there are two types of package that you can create one is called a managed package so those are the packages that can be upgraded from a distance so as you start to as you continue to build and improve your packages um, you can actually mass deploy them out to your customers using managed packages and what that means for customers is that they can't change the fields and the functionality that you give to them, but you can upgrade it for them. Um, unmanaged packages are when you um, you can't upgrade them and you're, you just deploy them as a one-off and then you let customers do what they want with it after that. It just provides the basics. Um, it uses standard... Um, so, so when you build these packages, you effectively just create, you just add all the different things that you've been building into the package and then you upload it to a special URL online. Um, so it has its own unique place on the internet. And then if when users click on that package, you can choose which um, environment to install the package into. So you could have it, you could install it into your, um, your sandbox, into your developer org, your trailhead playground, or your production org, God forbid, um, using this package link. Now, it can be a bit tricky, especially when you're working with trailhead playgrounds, because in trailhead playgrounds, the robots spin them up for you. So you don't actually get a chance to see your password. And in, often in order to install a managed password, you have got to log in to do that. So when we work with manage, with these packages, and sometimes Trailhead does throw a few of these at you in order for, to give you like basic functionality that you can then build on on top um, for the for the rest of the badge. Um, we have to go and we have to be able to log in and out of our playgrounds. Um, so the first thing that we have to do is to go and finally reset our passwords. So. Uh, la, 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 la. Where are we? We are in. No, we already did that one. Data model for recruiting. Yeah. Okay. So if you have your org available to you now, which I hope you have, just uh, go and launch it. Mine has now spun itself up, which is good. Handy tip. You can rename these. So if you have, let's say that um, you want to try and remember what org goes with what. Notice I've done that with mine. I've got a CPQ org. I've got a sales cloud super badge org. I've got nonprofit. I've got field service lightning. This one I'm just going to call my recruiting app. And then that helps me to remember when I'm looking to launch my playground what I am using. Um, and I'll name this one. Um, Learn Salesforce with Gemma. And then I know, looking at my big long list, you know, what on earth these do. And I tend to keep my super bad stuff because I like to go and blog about it afterwards. So I need something you know, to ref as a reference point. Okay. Now, get your login credentials. Hopefully, if you have launched your playground, click on get your login credentials. And just click reset my password. That's much better. You used to have to go and do it yourself. So now it's going to email my email address with the password. And then I just have to set it. And this takes you through the experience of what a user has to go through when you set them up um, for the first time on Salesforce. So I'm opening up my uh, Hotmail. interesting and I've got a lovely email that says finish resetting your developer edition password and you get this lovely long link so you just click on it
and then you're invited to change your password. Now, if you're a LastPass user like I am, what I like to do is actually use LastPass to generate the um, password itself. So um, if you want to, you can do that. Um, and believe me, I'll be changing it afterwards. Um, but you can use you can use this um, to store credentials. Now it can get fiddly if you use LastPass with Salesforce. It can be a bit bit fiddly because most Salesforce instances have the same URL, so it gets a bit confusing, um, especially if you work with uh, lots of people's different orgs. So, but if it's just you, you know what you can do is you can go incognito. You can create different Google personas if it, if it really matters that much to you. Uh, so I am going to basically just, and as you can see, if you use good, like I use Chrome and it stores lots of passwords as well because I freak out about losing them. So I am just going to put that password in plus another symbol so that those watching the recording don't end up hacking my org. And I'm going to change the password. Now LastPass will invite me to store it or at least should do. And do not click this <laughs> because, as you can see, it really, really wants me to uh, overwrite my usual Salesforce credentials, and I don't want to do that. So um, just be careful, be vigilant, look at the username before you hit yes and you overwrite any passwords. You're just getting a Salesforce login page. Cat, what are you looking at? You should be getting a reset password when you launch the second playground. Okay, so back to back to the beginning. What we did when we launched the playground was you click that to launch, and then there's a tab that appears at the top, which is called reset password. Sorry, it's not. It's called get your login credentials. Okay, can everyone see that? Still takes you to the Salesforce page. Oh, okay, awkward. Some of that depends on what you've got in your browser as well. Oh. Okay. Don't know how to reset password. When I launch the second playground, it still takes me to the Salesforce page. When you say Salesforce page, Salesforce login page. Right, okay. Um, well, obviously, you can't log in until you know your password, <laughs> okay? That's the awkward thing. So, uh, oh, I don't really know what to suggest if I can't see it. Yeah, I think maybe the playground is still spinning itself up, so just give it a minute, Kat. Um, if you want to, just come back and follow along once you've got it. Um, for those of you who've managed to reset your password, uh, well done. Um, please keep keep a note of it somewhere useful. Weird. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to make a note of mine, but my my computer is being very odd. When I try and paste something, it just isn't pasting anything. Okay, awkward. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and try this um, this new way of installing the package. Then, um, so where's where is it? Right. Okay, back to right. Okay, so. Back to our build a data model for recruitment app, create a custom object for reviews. We're going to go and um, install the manage package. And actually, what it's given you is a slightly simpler way of doing it. They seem to have um, updated the process, which is good. Um, so we're going to click the install a package tab. And then you'll see in Trailhead on the um, on in Trailhead. On um, step two, you'll see this ID that starts with 04. That's the package ID. So what um, 
what you should be able to do is actually in in your new playground is go into the installer package tab and then paste the id into the package id box there if you can't see this yet it's possible that it's still spinning it up for you okay and then you you are given this screen so this screen is is where users and administrators can actually install a package and it's the same for any kind of any kind of package that you install into salesforce um, we're going to install for all users and we're going to hit install so all that's doing is it's running a script inside your org that's um that's that's copying what's in the package itself down into your org and creating your own version of it. And I think I should probably close down all of my other tabs so that I don't get too confused. Okay. I know it says install for admins only, but I've done it for all. It doesn't really matter. So that will take that should take a moment. Okay. So I apologize if you're a bit lost. The, the badge that we're doing is called build a data model for a recruiting app. I had to change that reactively as we went because uh, when we started, when I, when I said let's start a project and, gave, and told you the project to go to, um, I realized that we have to do this one first. So now bearing in mind that some of the objects in here are the same objects that you have created in the, um, in the homework that we did last week with Steve. So there's a positions object, there's a uh, job descriptions, you know, all of that sort of stuff. Um, I don't want there to be any conflict between the homework that you did with Steve and this trailhead module, because it's going to take us a lot more time to go back and unpick everything than it would be if we just started afresh. So what we've done, uh, what I've taken you through just now is spinning up a brand new trailhead org, which hopefully you have all been able to do. Um, and resetting your password so that you can get in and out easily. Um, and then we have gone to install a package into your trailhead org. Is everybody up, is everybody up to speed with that? I apologize for any, any confusion. Okay, thank you. Thanks for letting me know um, that you were a bit lost. <laughs> I needed to know so I could, um, you know, rein it back in. Okay. So this like this install this package is going to take a minute to install, and when it's done, um, you should probably get an email saying that um, the package has been installed, um, and you're good to go. So just hit done, and then you're redirected straight back to your setup page for your new trailhead org and it now includes your installed package you will be able to see um, a package here called recruiting app package um, install just for admins according to trailhead just do it for admins i did it for all users but um, follow the trailhead <laughs> instructions Okay, the next thing that we need to do, and I'm just going to close some windows down because I don't want to confuse myself um, with what I'm looking at, and I do tend to do that sometimes. So if I don't need my windows anymore, I will get rid of them. The first thing that we have to do is to create a, um, is to create a review custom object. So now that we have our unmanaged package, we can go ahead and create our new custom object, okay? So we're gonna create reviews. The record name is a review number and it's an auto number and you have a display format here. So let's go ahead and do that. So back into um, backstage, I'm just gonna zoom in so you guys can see. It says it can't be installed, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> That's the worst thing about virtual training is you can't go, you can't floor walk and go and fix people's machines. Um, it says it can't be installed. Afshan, what's it saying other than it can't be installed? You need to be doing it in your new trailhead org. 
Uh, yeah, it says uh, I'm in the new org and it says can be installed. The name job application underscore is already used on component type. Custom object definition, please rename existing component. Right, that's because you've already got a job application instant, uh, job application custom object. So either you've installed it twice or tried to install it twice, or you're installing it in the org that you did your homework in. Okay, but this is the new org. It would still. Right, okay. Odd. If you go to, so to troubleshoot this, if you go into your home, your setup, and click home, and then type install, and click on installed packages, do you see an app there that's called recruiting app? Mm, just a second. Sure. Is it set up, right? Set up. Uh, yep. Recruiting app package, it should be called. Under packages? Under installed packages. Uh, it says Salesforce and Chatter apps install packages. That's it. Okay, that's interesting. Okay, I without looking at it, I can't really say. Um, the interesting thing is that um, you, so what you should have in there is uh, there are a few, as part of that package, there are four custom objects. One is interviewer, one is job application. The other is candidate and another one is position. Uh, yeah, I had the candidate object and the position object in the previous uh, trailhead, uh, trailhead org, but I shifted to a new trailhead org, so. Okay. Maybe do you think restarting all the tabs would help restarting sorry like uh closing everything and uh try it again maybe? no because it's cloud so it still exists whether you close it or not um oh. without seeing what you've done um with the trailhead orgs it's it's kind of hard to say um have you got as far as doing the package at least uh, yeah, I I understood how to install the package. I uh, it's not letting me install the package though. So okay, uh, in that case, I we'd have to. Uh, I'll have a look at it. We'll stay behind and have a look at it for you. Uh, uh, yeah, maybe we can do it after the class. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So those of you who have been able to do it, you should now see the four objects in your org. And the first thing we have to do is to create our review object. So we're going to go ahead and create. Um, and I'm going to create a custom object. Uh, we're going to call it review. And the plural is reviews. And the title of the object is review. Re record name is review number, not review name. And the data type is an auto number. And this is basically how you create sequential reference numbers for new objects, uh, new records, rather. So the new one is uh, rev-0000. So you'll see here that the syntax is, is shown. So you have to use curly brackets. So we're just going to go rev-0000. Oh, and starting number, I would imagine, would be one, yes. So what this means is for every new record you create, the name of it will be rev-0000 or rev-0001, 0002, 0003, et cetera. Um, we are going to allow reports and track field history. So we click those two settings and we make sure it's deployed. The next thing that we have to do is to allow search. So we tick that. And what does it say about notes and attachments? Yes, we want to add the notes and attachments related list. 
Okay, yell if I'm going too fast. We're just clicking some options here. So we want to make sure that we allow reports, we track field history, we it is deployed, that we allow search, that's allowing users to search for it, um, and to add notes and attachments related list so people can upload files, files against it. So does this need a tab? No, okay, we don't think so. So we save, done. Custom object is ready. The next thing we have to do is go to the next step, which is our job posting sites. So we're going to create a custom object for job posting sites. So back to our object manager, click object manager again, and then click create custom object. You see, once you get the hang of this, you can go quite fast. Job posting site is the name of the object. And the plural is job posting site. Now, is this going to be a name or is this going to be an auto number? It's a site name and it's text. Just get rid of the job posting part of that label. Now, what other settings do we have? So allow reports, track field history, allow search. So allow reports track field history and allow search do we need notes and attachments related list yes we do and we are going to launch the custom tab wizard and this is this makes it a lot easier to create your tabs with your custom objects if you click if you click this because it take this this tick box here tells salesforce which page to show when you saved this custom object so hit save now we're going to add a tab to this custom object. So does it say about the tab? So leave everything else as is. Use these criteria to configure the custom object tab. So we have to use the real estate sign as the tab style. So to do that, we, we've, we make sure we've selected the right object and we click the magnifying glass for tab style. A new window will open and we, everything's shown in alphabetical order. So we just find the tab style called real estate sign and we click that. We hit next. And then you, this is the part where we get to decide, you know, who gets to see this um, tab um, by default, whether it's on, off or hidden. So we're just gonna leave all the profiles as they are. We're gonna hit next. We're going to include this tab. Um, we're going to actually, why, why does it want us to do that? So, oh, okay, because we're going to create an app later. So we're going to create an app for this later. So we're just going to deselect the include tab. So what that means is we aren't going to see this tab in any of our apps. But we are going to append this tab to users' existing personal customizations. So what that means is each user is going to be able to choose to show this tab. Hit save. And then we've got some fields to create. So we have to go to fields and relationships. Let me just check the chat. Everyone all right? Yeah. I assume because you're quiet, um, I haven't upset anyone yet. We're good. <laughs> So uh, blah, 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 blah. back to our new field. And our new first new field is going to be a URL field. So we're going to allow people to enter a site URL into this field. And because this is a job posting site, it's going to be the job posting site URL. So we scroll down to the bottom and we find the URL data type and we click next. Jeremy's silently sobbing. Oh, Jeremy, you all right? <laughs> Sorry. Maybe this could be homework this week. <laughs> Job posting site URL. Don't worry about your descriptions. I'll let you off for this one. Hit next. Okay, so just to recap. We've created our job posting site custom object, and now we're creating our first field for it, which is our job posting site URL. And we're going to leave it 
that on for all of our profiles, hit next and click save and new because we're then going to create a second field. Sure. Okay, can't find include tab. So when you are creating your custom field and you get further down and it says, um, oh no, you were doing your tab, weren't you? So include tab in users' personal customizations is near, near the bottom. Yeah, okay, good, you've seen it. It's, near, it's right at the bottom underneath the big list. Okay, so new custom field. This one is going to be called the status field. Can anyone guess what type of what type of the 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 the, 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 the field we're going to create? <laughs> it's going to be a pick list, and it's a status field. Pop uh, flash question. If we're creating a pick list for status, what else could we create that would make the experience easier for users? Yeah, fixed values is one. What about specifically on the screen that they use? So uh, when you so the question is um, when you're creating a pick list called status, what else could you create? to improve the customer's, uh, the user's experience. New? Sorry, I don't understand that one. Yeah, you could help, um, help you could do help or description. Um, you could also create a path. Remember the path going across the top where you can change the status visually? Once you've got a pick list, you can actually use um, a pick list to create a new path. So if this one's going to be called status, our pick list values, we are going to add um, values, new values that are separated by a new line. OK, so if we click that second radio button, then we get to add some new values. And the two values we're going to add is active or inactive. Do you know what? I wouldn't have done that. I would have used a checkbox, but you know, everyone's different. Uh, then hit next. Hit next again. And save a new. And this is just a really quick way of creating all these fields. Um, another quick way is to use the schema builder. Um, next one we're going to create is the technical site, which is a checkbox. So we want to know when we're looking at this job posting site, we want to know if this is a technical one or not. So we're going to create a new field and we're going to call it a checkbox field, not a formula, a checkbox field. And the name of it is technical site. We're going to leave the default unchecked. We want people to actually tick it themselves. Hit next. Hit next. And save a new. And then finally, we're going to create a description field. Can anyone guess what type of text field we need to create for a description? Yes, it's going to be a long text area. Um, only for the purposes of this exercise. If I was doing this in real life, I'd make it a rich text field because then I could let people actually create. Um, I could let I could let people upload images or put bullet points in and and just make it a bit more um, useful in that way. So this is actually going to be a text area field, not a text area long. Apologies, I got that wrong and. Um, Manish, you got that right, apologies. So text area, next. And the label is description. Next again, next again, and save. So now HR can 
see where the job listings are posted. They can get to the link really easily and they can see whether the postings are actually active. Um, there's a little bit more that we have to do here. And remember last week I was talking about junction objects. We talked about opportunities, opportunity products. We talked about the way that products and price books all interact with each other. And we had a little diagram that I put together to explain that. So we have these relationships. What we need to create now is a junction object, which is similar to the price book entries. Um, it's not it is just in conceptually similar to the price book entries. We need to create a link between two objects that are very specific to an individual situation. And the objects that we're going to produce has gone. No, it's on my other screen, apologies. Uh, is the job postings themselves. So if you think about this logically, what we've got is a job, so uh, sorry, a position. So we have a position object. We then have a job posting site. So if you think about this conceptually, you've got uh, LinkedIn is the site and a position is Salesforce administrator. How do you actually reflect the number of postings? What if you've got three, three positions open for that job? Uh, what if you are posting that job on four different sites? Um, at that point, it doesn't become clear how you relate those two things together. So you have to create a custom junction object. So a job posting fits in the space between positions and employment websites. One position can be posted many times and one employment website can have many job postings. But the job posting is always a single position on a single website. So it's that one instance. It's the fact that you posted that job on LinkedIn versus posting that job on um, match.com. Anyway, um, so not that you'd ever post a job on there, but you know. Um, so for this instance, what we need to do is create a brand new object called job posting. So we're going to hit new. And we are going, oh, no, I'm completely wrong. We're going to go to object manager and hit new, <laughs> hit create custom object. OK, and this is called job posting. And the plural is obviously job postings. Now, let's see, are we doing a name? We are doing an auto number. So our record name, we need to change it from being job posting name to job posting number, and then change the data type to auto number. So again, this is assigning a reference number um, instead, of a, instead of a title, if you like, or a subject. Because we've already got that title and subject on the job, on the position, and we've already got it on the site as well because you've got the site name so all this is doing is just as a formality it creates this this name of the record um when actually it logically doesn't make sense to have that name but you can use reference numbers so we're going to create a starting number one just checking the chat cool then leave everything else as it is and then click save now what we need to do is create a master a master detail relationship between job posting and position. So because this is master detail, we are treating the job posting as a child to the position, which means that we need to create the relationship on the child object. So we're going to click new and we're going to create a new master detail relationship which means that job posting will be the child to the position. Hit next. OK, we lost. So what we've been doing, Manish, is we created an object called um, job posting site, didn't we? So now we are creating and then we also and then we have a um, custom object called position that we installed with our managed package, our unmanaged package. Um, so what we now need to do is to join these two together. And the reason we have to do it with a with a custom object sitting in between is because we want to reflect 
if you have a if you have a, a, a position so salesforce administrator and you want to post it on five different job sites um how do you even do that right um because you could have because each different job site could have a start date and an expiry date and it could cost a different amount of money to post it to post that position with that job site so if you were to create a relationship between a position and a site all you're doing is just saying right this is this is one position that has been advertised on one site but the requirement itself is around actually being able to take one one position so one salesforce administrator role and advertise it on five different sites so what you need to do is be able to track each posting itself and we do that using a junction object so we say we advertise the salesforce administrator job on monster and it started on this date expires on this date and it costs this amount of money for the listing we then the second job posting might be i posted that salesforce administrator job on Glassdoor, and it cost me this amount of money and actually you know it might have a different expiry date etc so it's fitting that we have this job posting um, object in the middle but also and the reason we, the reason it's master detail is because it's for two reasons one is sharing so if we're looking at a position we want to see all the postings for that position but also if we're looking at a site we want to see everything that we're posting against that site if the second reason is for like roll is for roll-up summaries is for being able to say if i look at a um a position of, of salesforce administrator how many sites have i advertised it on one, two, three, four, five. We can do that using a roll-up summary because we have five child records underneath that say which sites they were all posted on. Is everybody up? Is everybody with me? Okay, thank you guys. <laughs> okay, so we now so what what we started to do was to just go to the job posting object click fields and relationships create a new field and call it and it's and specify that it's a master detail field we have to do that on the child record which is the posting itself so on the posting we have to say what's the position that this posting is about and in a minute we'll do the same thing but for the site so what site is this position posted onto for this instance, let's just go and um, blah, 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 link it to the position. So we just scroll through the list of objects and we find position. If you want to, you could just hit um, the P on your keyboard and click position. Hit next. And our next, uh, yep, so all we have to do is we're happy with the field label by default. It just says position. If you want to put some help text in, just say this is um, the position that this uh, listing is for. And hit next. Uh, leave it open, leave it visible for all of your users and have it on your page layout. Hit next. Then you'll notice with relationship fields, it asks you to say what should the relationship uh, the related list label be and this is where it can get interesting we're leaving it as it is for now but um, if you've ever like as you start to design more solutions um, there are times when I have to change this related list label to because it will mean that relationship means different things but for this instance we don't have to worry about it so when you're ready just hit save and new because we're going to go straight back in and create a second master detail relationship So we go back. So if we hit save and new, it takes us straight back to our, you know, create a field uh, and choose the type. So we hit master detail relationship. Click next. And then we are going to relate our posting to a job posting site. So click in your related to. I'm going to tap the letter J on my keyboard. And I'm going to find job posting site, which is the object that I created about five to ten minutes ago. I'm going to hit next. Again, um, put some help text in if you want to. And click next. Obviously, all your profiles. Click next. Add it to your page layout. Click next. And just leave the related list as it is. 
So what this is now saying is that when you look at the job posting site page, you will see a related list, which is called job postings. OK, right now it comes the fun part. We get to modify our page layout. So if you're all with me and we have got um, our junction object in place, our job posting in place, let me just check the chat. OK, nobody's killed themselves yet. We're doing well. <laughs> OK, so we, we're actually going to go and change the page layout for the um, job posting site, first of all. So back to your object manager. Quick find job P and then go to job posting site. And we're going to make a couple of changes to our Oh, for God's sake, sorry, I've done it wrong. It's not the uh, job posting site, it's the position, I apologize. So back to our object manager, type in posts and click on position. Okay, once you're on the position object, go to page layouts and we're going to click on the position layout and we're gonna get back to our lovely um, pos uh, position page layout editor. Now, what does it want us to do? The first thing we're going to do is to change the job posting site related list on the position. And the reason we're going to do that is when you scroll down and you look at the related lists, I'm zoomed in so far, okay, you will see that you only see the job application, uh, the job posting number, right? on your related list and that's not very useful for a user to log in and look at a position and just see a position number they're going to want to know a little bit more about it they're going, they're going to want to know what's the site that it's been posted on and what's the url so what we do for the related list to change that information for the position for people viewing the position record we're going to click the spanner here and that enables us to choose which fields we want to show on the related list now you'll notice as this is a master detail relationship, you've got more fields that you can post. You can post, you can put fields into this list from the posting site object and also from the position object um, on the other side, on the other side. So when people view a position when, when people view a position record and they look at the job postings, um, record uh, related list you, they will be able to see information from the posting site itself so we're going to pull over into this uh related list okay uh the status of the job posting site so we're going to click that and click add and we are also going to pull in the technical site field and so on so now when users view this related list they won't just see the num the reference number they will actually see the reference number the status and the site and hit okay and you can see the difference there already so quick save um something else we're going to be doing is we're actually going to take away that job posting number that reference field we don't need it it's no use to anybody. All it is is it's there for formality's sake. We created a custom object. We, you know, if we if we'd left it as a name or a text field, then that's something else a user has to fill in. And if they don't know what to put in there, that's more questions that you have to answer later. So it's right that it's a reference number, but it's just a reference number that enables a user to click on something. So it doesn't actually mean anything to the business itself. So we can remove it from this related list. So we're going to go back to our spanner on the related list. And we're going to just click on the job posting number and we're going to click remove. And hit say hit OK. And quick save. Remember to quick save as you go. You never know when you lose your Internet. Then. OK, so now when someone looks at a position, they'll see the status and they'll see um, that it's been posted on a technical site. I don't know why you wouldn't put the site name on there, but anyway. So hit save. 
Then back to our object manager, we are going to go and make a change to the job posting site page layout now. So just type in job o and click on job posting site. So we're going to go and uh, update that related list as well. Position related list. So page layouts, job posting site. A quick one, why is it saying position related list? I just want to check job posting site. Did they tell us to change the related list label? Master detail, just junction object. Let me just double check, guys. Site. Build label job posting site. No. No, we're good. We're good. We're good. We're good. Okay, let me just check the chat. Everyone's fine. Cool. Okay. Got seven minutes. Let's see how far we can get through this. Um, blah, 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 blah. Position related list. So it's not the position related list. It's actually the job postings related list. Okay. So next to job posting site layout, click edit. Uh, scroll down to the job postings related list and click the spanner. We're going to do that. And we are going to pull over the status and the title from the position. So you notice how you've got position fields on here now um, because of that, relate, that relationship. So pull over the status, pull over the title, and we're going to remove the job posting number just like we did before and click OK, and click Save. OK, is everybody with me? Cool. Okie doke. So now we're going to test it. We're going to go to our nine dots in the corner, and we're going to go and find our Positions tab. So I'm just going to look for that there. Right, so positions. Let's add some data into our new custom object. So we're going to create a position called Super Sales Rep in the Sales Department. So we're going to click New. Department is Sales. Approval status is Approved. Location is US. Job description is, I'm going to copy it from Trailhead and paste it into the chat for you. So sales rep to join the AW computing team serving the Eastern region of America. Click save and then click the pencil. So remember we created um you remember we had the the job the job posting sites tab and we didn't add it to any applications all we did was just to say we will add it to users personalized um tabs well this is how we do that so we go into the top right hand corner and we click our pencil and we click add more items and this enables us to select from the all menu we can actually add any object we want really uh, sorry, any tab that we want. So I'm going to pull in the job application, uh, job posting sites um, and add that item so that I can get to it without having to go through my nine dots, if that makes sense. Okay, and now I can see that tab across the top, which is exactly where I want it. So we're going to create a new job posting. 
So I'm just going to click on that and um, on the drop down, and then I can see the plus sign where I can click new job posting site. Let me just check the chat, make sure you're all okay. Yeah, cool. So this site is going to be called Lots of Jobs. Lots dash o dash oh, lots dash o dash jobs. Okay, uh, job posting site URL is www dot not lost jobs, lots of jobs dot com, and our status is active, and hit save. Okay. I'm just going to bring your attention to something. Let's look at the related lists. Do you see here we now have our job postings and there's nothing there at the moment. Um, if we go back to super sales rep, which I just clicked there at the top and look at related, I've still got no, no job postings. So all we're going to do later on is relate the two together. Um, hopefully that should help to contextualize some of this so that you've got the site is called Lots of Jobs. At some point, you're going to post the super sales rep on the Lots of Jobs website. Make sense? Cool. Why is super sales rep a tab? It's a tab because I had it open um, and, I, and I recently viewed it. So it's just left it there. Because um, I was when I was viewing this and I clicked new job posting site. And then I filled in the modal here. It just leaves it there. Something else that you can do. Remember that I taught you in the very first um, in the very, very first lesson, how you can favorite certain things. I can now add that position to my favorites. OK. We now come to the end of end of time. Um, do you want to take this away and do it as some homework for the week, where you can go and build your recruiting app, and then perhaps what we could do um, on Wednesday is actually have somebody volunteer to demo it. Yeah. So you can talk us through what you built. And if you, as a stretch target, if you want to, maybe create a couple of reports for us to look at. Okay. I will then, so in that case then, your homework for this week is to finish off building a data model for a recruiting app and to, um, cust and to complete this badge here for customizing a user interface for a recruiting app. I think... It says, it says it should take you about an hour for this one. It'll probably take you a lot less, um, given what you know already. Um, so that's your task. Um, and you know, if you, if you want to volunteer to do it, then really all it means you have to do is, is be able to be ready to demo it on Wednesday. So we'll do that. Let's do that as the first thing, Wednesday. Um, let's, have, let's spend the first hour um, looking at your apps and then we'll take a we'll have a, a, a whistle stop tour around service cloud um, and then next week we're going to be we're going to start looking at process automation so exciting times you guys are doing doing really really well so thank you for sticking with us right so if anybody needs any help please feel free to stay behind um, if not, then uh, please feel free to, to drop. Uh, thank you very much for coming, everybody. And thanks for your patience with me <laughs> and, and with the uh, Trailhead Playgrounds as well. You take care and I'll speak to you Wednesday.